America's been drinking beer from a company that doesn't even know which restroom to use. That's why I created Conservative Dad's ultra-right, 100% woke-free beer. As conservatives, we're constantly getting hit in the face, left and right, by the woke mind virus. But the last place we want it is in our beer. If you know which bathroom to use, you know what beer you should be drinking. Stop giving money to woke corporations that hate our values. And to the rest of you woke corporations, stay the away from our kids. Buy yours online in 42 states at ultrarightbeer.com. Tastes like freedom. Uh, Matt, I really hope it just repackaged some Bud Light. I, you know what I'm in the mood for after after seeing that a nice refreshing cold Bud Light, right? Like close up on the packaging, uh, exploded it with the baseball bat of the of the super refreshing cold crispy beer exploding over the diamond. I, I don't know. It seems like it. I don't know that you should spend that much time in your ad uh, showing your competitor's product. I, I'm just assuming he just drank it all uh, and then just peed into these cans, and that's what he's selling. That's what I hope, anyways. <laughs> yeah. Um, it would be much funnier if if we all took out our Bud Lights now, but, like, honestly, I can't do that even for a bit. Uh, I can't stand, <laughs> you know, Bud Light. I'm, I'm good with the, you know, I'm good with their advertising campaign. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, uh, uh, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, but in any case, um, I am Ben Burgess. This is Give Them an Argument. I am joined, as always, by our super producer, Jake Appet, and uh, by our very talented graphic designer, J. Andrew World. Um, and later in this episode, we are going to be joined by fan favorite recurring guest, uh, Matthew McManus, uh, currently... Um, teaches political science at uh, the University of Michigan, uh, which despite being a East Lansing native, I forgive him for and uh, can still have him uh, on the show. Um, and he's going to be talking about Heidegger. Uh, Matt is somebody who seems to write articles about Heidegger about once a year. Uh, we, uh, we found a bunch of them to uh, prepare for this. That should be a really interesting conversation. But, you know, look, Heidegger can wait. Uh, we do have serious topics to address first. Uh, like, um, does, does Ben Shapiro have any thoughts about Frozen 4? Um, I would guess no, but uh, actually, no, I'm looking and it seems like he does, actually. So let's, uh, let, let's, let's see what he thinks. At Disney has been on the retreat socially since people decided they don't wish to invest in their product. We'll see if Disney continues to double down. The great suspicion is that in Frozen 4, they'll make Elsa a lesbian. If they, by the way, if they do that, it is the end of Disney as a, as a company. Predict it. You can write it down. It is April 17th. If they do that in Frozen 4, they'll destroy Disney. Like, thoroughly destroy it. I should have known better. He does have opinions on, on Frozen 4. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, I guess this is... I think, I think Lou Savage on Twitter said something about how there are two kinds of Disney adults and one of them is in the GOP. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, and DeSantis is both because he got married at Disney and is now and is now the other type of Disney adult. So you, it's it, honestly, it's a pipeline, I feel like. It's people who care just too much about Disney. Also because like half of them want to be musical theater uh, stars anyway, right? <laughs> if they weren't right-wing pundits. <laughs> oh, we did establish that about, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, James O'Keefe. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, which you know, gotta say, uh, Ben Burgess still a Jacobin. James O'Keefe no longer Project Veritas. So, <laughs> you know, conclude from that what you want. Uh, but uh, he's uh, he's much better than he's than that, so, you know, Yes. He's got that going for him. Uh, yeah. So obviously, uh, you know. I will say there have been other things going on this week besides uh, what Ben Shapiro just called the great concern, uh, which is uh, whether uh, 
a a fictional cartoon princess, uh, you know, likes boys or girls. That's the obviously. I, I, I want to say one quick thing about that. Not about the not about the idiotic content, but if you're someone who's like, you know, I really like Ben Shapiro's takes on, let's say, how we should run our economy, but I find his cultural stuff a little silly. Uh, I'm not saying you have to um, take the totality of someone's beliefs when you listen to them, but like. If someone is stupid that, like, think about how stupid what he just said really is. Uh, and then just think about, I would just, it's a pitch from me to you. It's just like, think about how that might reflect on the rest of his opinions that you, that you agree with more. That's, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, for Josh Blanchard has a, uh, a paper on the epistemic bad company problem, which is like, uh, the, um, the flip side of, you know, there's this long-standing literature on uh, epistemic peer disagreement, which is like, okay, what should you do when you find out somebody who's researched something just as much as you have and, and has, you know, is just as good at reasoning as you, disagrees with your opinion. And, uh, he has this paper sort of saying, okay, people are always worried about that, but like, what about the opposite problem, right? What if you find that like idiots keep agreeing with you? Like, uh, at some point, you know, I know it doesn't, like, logically follow, right, that you're wrong, but at some point, does that make you start to question, you know, like, at least whether you need to look harder at the evidence? Well, yeah, well, the world is really complicated, right? So we're looking to smart people to help us make sense of things that are difficult for us to do all the research on our own. So obviously, ideally, we'd have time to look over all the evidence, but I'm just saying, take something com complex like the economy, right? And Ben Shapiro has opinions on that where I think he's trying to, you know, mystify it uh, and make it and, and arrive at wrong conclusions by mystifying some of the premises. But then look at, look, you know, look at his opinions on things you you can really wrap your mind around, like like Frozen for, you know, like things that you can understand really quickly. Uh, no doubt there are some people who the that is the point of Ben Shapiro as opposed to the economic, uh, you know, conservatism, but, uh, you know, if you consider yourself on the fence, that, that's my pitch. Uh, that's my pitch to you. I think we should. He's I the think movie that's guy, it. too. He, he's supposed to be like the oh. movie guy, too, because remember, he went to Hollywood to, to write stuff. And uh, it's weird because, like, uh, in the same video, he actually was talking about uh, Harry Potter at one point, or maybe it was a different video. I don't know. I've watched too much Ben Shapiro today already. And, um, he, he was talking about like, uh, but he didn't quite know what Daniel Radcliffe's done recently. And it's like, my man, he just played Weird Al. Like, like th that's on a level you can grasp. Swiss Army Man, I get. Like, Swiss Army Man's probably too too heady for him. He's not smart enough to handle that. But, but you know, my dude, you're supposed to be the, uh, the conservative movie guy. Yeah. Sure. So, okay, so this is interesting. Ben Shapiro is a failed screenwriter. Uh, the... James O'Keefe is a failed musical theater kid. Um, I, yeah, now, like now, I'm curious, right? It's like I, I want to go down the line, right? The crowd. Tim Pool's a failed uh, pro skater. Although uh, he he now has he now has a successful band, so you know he's got that going for him. Um, it's honestly, it's not as bad. You know, should really like. Maintained for the purposes of the joke, it's just like extremely grand. But um, I do, uh, I do still maintain that you know, if he, uh, you know, pool, you know, might not be interested in doing more debates, but you know, uh, he can at least do a battle of the band. You know, Jason Miles can get a band together, and they can do a battle of the bands. Um, oh hell yeah! Know, actually, a touring musician for years, so you know, that's. Uh, I think that would be interesting. I'm down for right. that. So, as I said, there are things other than this great concern we all have about uh, about whether uh, the um, cartoon princess uh, is a lesbian, which would obviously be horrible and lead to the Disney Corporation no longer existing. Which you know, clearly that that would be the outcome of that. Um, that uh, there have been a few other things that have been going on this week, uh, so I do want to cover. A uh, couple of these briefly in uh, the time we have. We've also got a few other things we need to get to before that. So uh, one of them uh, is about uh, Rashida Tlaib. I wrote about this for uh, for Jackman. Uh, so 
Rashida Tlaib uh, issued a, well, she took the lead on a letter that she got uh, several other uh, members of Congress to sign, uh, a lot of usual suspects, AOC, Jamal Bowman, people like that, uh, uh, calling for the Justice Department to, uh, it, was a, it was an open letter to Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, calling in the Justice Department to drop its indictment of Julian Assange and stop trying to extradite him which uh, this article about Jacobin, Rashid Tlaib is right, the attempt to extradite Julian Assange is a huge threat to press freedom. You know, making the basic point that it doesn't really matter what you think about Julian Assange as a guy, what you suspect or don't suspect about him, about other things he's been accused of, whether you like his politics or not. None of that has anything to do with anything. The sort of key question of principle, I think, is very correctly identified in uh, the Tlaib letter, which is do we want to criminalize investigative journalism? That this would be the first time, you know, what Assange is, you know, they're trying to extradite him to the United States for is violated the Espionage Act. They point out in the letter, this would be the first time in history that the Espionage Act uh, would have been used uh, uh, purely for publishing truthful information uh, that, uh, that, you know, what he published, WikiLeaks, is like accurate stuff about American war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and you know, Guantanamo Bay and etc. Like, you know, they publish lots of other stuff too, but that's that's the part they're mad about. Uh, and the accusations, well, this is information that the United States government classified, which in this case is kind of particularly horrifying because, you know, Julian Assange is not even an American. Uh, you're talking about a foreign journalist uh, potentially being extradited to the United States for publishing information that the United States government decided should be secret. Um, that's, uh, that's an incredibly disturbing precedent if, if they're successful in, in doing that. Right? It's a, a chilling effect certainly on U.S. media. I mean, the reason you know, the Obama administration, the ways that I get into in the article, was god-awful on uh, press freedom issues. They cracked down really hard on leakers and actually took pretty unprecedented measures to go after leakers, including, um, and, you know, they were, you know, not shy about going after press organizations like the Associated Press that, you know, in, or in order to try to crack down on people within the U.S. government who leaked secrets. Uh, but even the Obama administration decided not to prosecute Assange. They were thinking about it. They really wanted to. They hated him. But they decided not to because of what was internally referred to as the New York Times problem, which is the problem of how to legally differentiate what Assange was doing at WikiLeaks from what the New York Times had done many, many times, uh, including with some of the same information. That's like, well, how can we justify prosecuting Assange in a way that wouldn't also mean we'd have to, uh, we'd have to crack down on the New York Times? Uh, and they decided that there was no solution to this problem. They didn't do it. They were willing to, you know, willing to prosecute him, but they... You know, there's a sort of uh, line of authoritarianism they, they weren't willing to cross. Uh, the Trump administration decided that they were pretty happy traipsing across that line. And so they did indict Assange and then the Biden administration, disturbingly, this is not the only area where that's the case, has uh, just continued with horrible shit that happened in the Trump administration, even when it was reversing better things that had happened. Uh, in the previous administration where Joe Biden was vice president. There, uh, there are immigration examples of this. There are foreign policy examples of this. Um, but uh, this one is a press freedom example. So, so Tlaib uh, and co. are, you know, I think, very correctly uh, calling on them to stop doing that. I doubt they'll listen, but I think it's... Um, you know, I, I think it is a really positive development, right? There are people in Congress who are taking this up. Uh, also, yeah, Jake. Oh, uh, two things. Uh, one, a commenter let us know. I think the mic is hitting a your your mic is hitting the wire. So, so yeah, yeah it's not in the uh, not in the home studio right now. So uh, have to have this headset. That's getting a little loose. I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we we could give uh, props to Bad Lefty, um, but also uh, just just uh, your. Yeah. Good lefty. Uh, yeah, re real, real quick take. Uh, just would you? It seems to me like Rashida is, takes the little riskier stances of, of the squad members, or you know, the, the principal risky stances. Uh, 
you know, I don't have the the list on the top of my head, but whenever this happens, where it seems like she's kind of a leader, even amongst the even amongst the squad. So um, for sure, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. She was also the only one of them who voted the right way on uh, the uh, the railroad strike. Uh, that just mm-hmm. sort of took the yes uh, standard principle that it's like, look, I understand what you're trying to do with the strategy here, but it doesn't really matter because the sort of principle is too important here. To you know, to give up on the right to strike uh, in this case. So, uh, so yeah, big big props to uh, Rashida Tlaib, uh, and to, you know, the state of Michigan by extension, the best state. Uh, so, um, so yeah, at the uh, also had an article in the Daily Beast on a very closely related topic. Uh, this is on the Pentagon leaks. Uh, the uh, so the title they gave it, which is a little overblown from what I said in the article, but um, it's like close enough, it's fine, right? It was the Pentagon leaker as a public service hero. Uh, I think the more accurate thing to say is he might not have had particularly heroic intentions, but I don't really care about that. That's, you know, beside the point. Uh, you know, I, every time there's a leak, uh, there's discussion gets diverted to sort of the personal virtue or lack thereof of the leaker. And I could not really care less about that, right? I don't care whether this particular guy is a good guy or a bad guy or what his intentions were or anything like that. What I care about is should the American public be aware of what the U.S.'s uh, foreign policy is? Like some like incredibly consequential foreign policy decision, like, for example, put in special forces boots on the ground in Ukraine, which is one of the things that was revealed by uh, the, uh, the Pentagon leaks. And nobody seems to be tripping over themselves to deny that. Uh, now, we are talking, I should say, to be fair, about a tiny number of boots on the ground. Um, this is uh, out of all the NATO forces that have special forces personnel, you know, NATO countries that have special forces personnel on the ground in Ukraine, we're talking about like 100 people total, and only a small minority of those are Americans. And yet, uh, if you start thinking about scenarios where American soldiers and Russian soldiers are shooting at each other, um, you know, that could be bad. And that strikes me as the kind of thing, whether we're willing to roll the dice on the possible consequences of that, that it would have been nice in a democracy to have a public debate about, especially since the president actually last year to not bad for the New York Times promised explicitly that he wouldn't do this, this this exact thing that it's revealed uh, that he did. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's a really good thing, right? Uh, whether or not the intentions are particularly heroic, I mean, whatever, like, um, whether it's sort of uh, accidentally or intentionally uh, heroic, it's a very, very good thing to expose this information to the American public. Uh, so. Uh, we could, you know, have some kind of say on uh, what we'd like, you know, our nation's foreign policy to be. Whether we think, uh, you know, whether uh, whether we're willing to take that risk of American and Russian soldiers uh, shooting each other uh, in uh, on uh, on the ground in Ukraine. In that example, it's not the only sort of bombshell revelation, but I mean, it's it's maybe the biggest one in there, and. You know, before I switch gears, the one thing I did just want to say about this one is it's like a little bit funny, right? So sometimes, uh, you know, I'll write an article for like Compact, which is a magazine that, you know, is open to certain kinds of social democratic things, but, you know, they certainly have like culturally conservative editorial views I don't like. Um, I've debated Zora Bamari, who's you know, one of the main editors on the show. I've written criticisms of them, a Jacobin, but you know, but it's like, yeah, if there's like something we agree about, I'm asking them to write an article about it, right? Sometimes I'll say yes. And that's sort of controversial. I read an article from Daily Beast, nobody blinks an eye at that. Like, yeah, sure, why not? Right. Uh, I do just want to point out this too is writing behind ideological enemy lines, right? It's just a different ideological enemy. And if you want evidence of that, I think um, it's I think it's useful to look at how uh, quite a few Daily Beast readers responded to my article 
about why, in fact, leaking uh, what American foreign policy is so Americans can have a say on it is a good thing. And uh, I think we have a little montage here, several of the reactions. Uh, why are you printing this shit? Pathetic. What the fuck kind of opinion is this? Uh, typical birdie crap bullshit. Uh, fuck off and keep fucking off. Keep fucking off uh, till you get to a gate with the side saying you can fuck off past here, climb over the gate, dream the impossible dream, and keep fucking off forever. Uh, that's insane. Uh, okay, this one just says scum. Uh, so that I will say this this guy's the most succinct out of out of all the reader you know comments that we've seen so far. Points for that. Yeah, yeah, yes. Clarity uh, is important. Yeah, I, I think if you could do it in one syllable, you don't need to say all this. Next guy's not nearly so succinct. Uh, very patriotic Americans and allies may die because of what Malika did. So he's a hero. You fucking disgust me. You're a super shitty American. Uh, this article is psycho. And then the last one just says, uh, these communists love traitors. So, um, yeah, I, the libs uh, have, um, I mean, this is one of those things that, like, they love the national security state. Like, they really are extremely attached to it. And, you know, again, uh, you know, it can be ideologically enemies of different people in different ways, right? But this is, this is just, uh, you know, maybe worth noting as you, as you sample this buffet of Daily Beast reader feedback to the Pentagon leak story. I, I got to say, the uh, one of them, because uh, we covered up the names, and part of their name was actually Wolf Warrior, which is fascinating because that's like a Chinese thing. Um, but very specifically, <laughs> it's it's like a jingoistic Chinese thing. Uh, pe people are uh, like people who work for the state are proud Wolf Warriors for the state. Um, and, and this is like like what they brag about. So it's like, uh, are, uh, did it just sound yeah, cool? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I don't get me wrong. Wolf Warrior Two, I, I freaking love that movie. It's 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 awesome. Like like you know, he drives his car through a hospital and hops out and starts beating up this Russian that's twice as big as him. I like you know how cooler, much cooler can you get in a movie like that? You know, a single shot where's like tying up pirates with a harpoon. Awesome, you know. <laughs> but but like, <laughs> uh, I don't still understand like like you know what the what the intent of that is. And he, here's somebody who's commenting specifically on you know your very I think patriotic American take, um, you know, because because this is this is truly what uh, you know Americans' beliefs are, and and they're 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 saying that you're doing bad stuff with this hashtag from the Chinese government. I mean, I'm sure the phrase wolf. I'm sure they just saw the phrase wolf warrior somewhere, maybe on Netflix, and it sounded cool to them. Would be my guess about that. Uh, but um, although it is funny, I was actually telling, so I was in uh, New Jersey and New York this last weekend. I uh, made a little pilgrimage to the picket line at the Rutgers strike. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but then uh, I did that on Friday. Then on Saturday, I saw a few people in New York, including Jake. And, uh, and so I, I, I think I said this to you then, uh, we're out at the bar on Saturday night, that it's like funny that, you know, people will uh, constantly accuse me of being a Putin apologist for wanting de-escalation in Ukraine. Nobody ever accuses me of being a Xi apologist. I don't understand why not. I mean, I have, uh, like, surely you could make at least as good a case there, you know, that, like, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I would also like uh, to de-escalate tensions between U.S. and China. I mean, just for a change, every 10 times it could be like, you know, you fucking Xi apologist. Yeah, you spent a lot of uh, Saturday night apologizing for, uh, for, for, for the China. Like, the chairman didn't mean to. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, so, all right. Uh, so I do want to bring in that in uh, just a minute, uh, but I want to do a few more things first. Uh, so uh, while we're on the subject of civil liberties, um, 
what to uh, play. This is from, um, so there's this festival that it, they have every year in the UK. It's the, uh, the Hay Festival. I think the uh, official name is how the light gets in. Uh, they have music and like lectures and panels and stuff. Uh, that, is the, that is the thing for 2023. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, yep. Uh, so, um, uh, recurrent GTA guest Slavoj Zizek is the first name in very large letters at the bottom in very small letters. There's and many more. That's me. Uh, but uh, I was uh, I was at that uh, I was at that last year. I'm going to be there again uh, this year. So it's next month. Going to have some more information about that in just a minute. But um, some of the stuff from last summer uh, they've. Uh, they finally started releasing. They, they have a giant backlog. So this is all stuff from last May, but they've just started to put some of it out. And we have a couple of short clips from that. Uh, so uh, one of them, well, you know, we've been talking about this Assange and Pentagon leak stuff. So while we're still on uh, the civil liberties question, uh, so this is the one uh, in the clips. It's just, I think it's just called like Dead and IAI. If uh, social media as we know it had existed in 2002 and um, they had you know, strict policies against misinformation, who would be more likely to be booted for misinformation? People who agreed with George Bush, Tony Blair, and the New York Times there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or people who didn't? Around the time that Elon Musk was pretending he was going to buy Twitter, we don't know whether he's actually going to do it. You wrote an article saying despite the fact that he has this kind of position of absolute yeah. free speech, that that wouldn't really help free speech. Why did, you, why did you think that? Yeah, so I think it's possible that if Elon Musk actually did go ahead with the purchase, I think it's entirely possible that there would be moderation policies there. Uh, for better or for worse, I doubt that he would do exactly what he was saying, but you know, they, I think it's entirely possible the policies would change in a direction I would like. But the point I was making in that article is that um, one, I don't particularly trust him on this. I think uh, if you look at his own history of union busting, if you look at his own history of being very hair trigger about suing people for libel, uh, I don't particularly believe that he would, uh, that, you know, maybe he would surprise me, but I'd, I, I would be very unsurprised if uh, he wasn't quite good to his, uh, good, uh, you know, good on his word on free speech policies on Twitter, but that's, you know, I could be wrong about that. The larger point, the more important point to my mind is that it's kind of absurd that you should have to hope that some benevolent rich person is going to buy the digital public square and that they're gonna allow lots of free speech there. I mean, you know, as if in actual literal public squares we lived in some sort of, you know, libertarian dystopia where those were privately owned. And so you could only hold a public protest march if the particular sidewalk you were, you know, marching down happened to be owned by a free speech billionaire instead of an anti-free speech billionaire, that, that seems like a, a very short-sighted solution to me. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know what the L to W proportions are there. That's obviously before the Elon Twitter acquisition happened um, when I was being interviewed there. Hey, uh, I guess I guess I did say I'd be very unsurprised if he didn't follow through. Uh, I was probably leaving the door open, uh, you know, like hedging my bets more than I really needed to. But, um, you know, for anybody who's just coming into the story now, uh, Elon Musk has uh, been wildly hypocritical in his management of, 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 of Twitter. And he's like done lots of censorship. And, you know, there's a, yeah, I don't know. Who could have possibly see it coming? Shocked. I am shocked. I'm shook to my core. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, also, now this one uh, that we just played, uh, that I believe is fully available on YouTube. This, it's uh, like there's a part of it that you can see on their website. I think it's available for subscribers, but what to just play the public part. So uh, this is a debate um, that I took part in in Hay last year uh, with a few people. You'll, you'll hear who they are. Uh, one of them is uh, a member of parliament. Uh, the, uh, they were, um, uh, at that point, 
Uh, she was the uh, shadow leader of the House of Commons, which is way less cool than it sounds. Uh, that just, uh, you know, that's that's just like a position for like the person in the opposition party who, like, you know, it's it's like mostly an administrative, you know, kind of role. Uh, but um, but basically, somebody in this sort of, I don't know, like maybe the the center left of the kind of more Starmer than Corbyn kind of element of the Labour Party and in, uh, in Britain. There's also like a DJ who's on that panel. So uh, in any case, uh, let's uh, let's roll that clip, talk about it for just a minute, and then uh, then we'll bring on Matt. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming. I think this is going to be a really fascinating panel. We've got great guests here. So what are we going to talk about? Well, the COVID pandemic opened our eyes to the jobs that society can't live without. From lorry drivers to supermarket shell stackers, the roles often seen as lower status proved indispensable. So both left and right called for unprecedented wage rises in these newly valued and vital sectors. But changes in wage levels also imply a reassessment of the relative value that we attach to the roles themselves. So should we conclude that we have overvalued professional and middle-class office and management roles? Should we abandon the assumption that a university education leads to a more highly paid and valued role and eradicate current social hierarchies in order to level up? Or should we retain pay differentials and protect the status quo with the educated elite taking their rightful place at the top? That's what we're going to discuss today. So on to our speakers. Ben Burgess is a philosophy professor at Morehouse University Perimeter College, a columnist for the Jacobin magazine and ARC Digital Media, and the co-host of the Dead Pundits Society. Thangam Dagmanair is Labour MP for Bristol West and shadow leader of the House of Commons. And Nimone Metaxas is a DJ, radio presenter, television presenter, and producer. Uh, yeah, that's so. I very poor facial control there. Uh, I'm, I'm cringing because I think they had like a bio that was already like two years old or something at that point, and that also just got mixed up about some of the stuff in the bio. So they they like merged together the names of like three different universities they're taught at various points into like one super college. And, uh, and then uh, also said that I was the co-host of the dead pundit society, which is in fact a show I did co-host before I started this one. Uh, but uh, I had not for a long time uh, before uh, last summer. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, putting that aside, I uh, do want to go on to uh, to watch uh, oh and Arc Digital Media. That was I, I was a columnist for Arc Digital Media. That was also a while ago, but whatever. Uh, let's uh, let's watch just a little bit of uh, of the uh, the debate itself. Just uh, give yeah, me a sense. yeah. And, and and I gotta say, I don't want to judge people by their names, but they just have those like fancy. They just sound like very fancy names. What is her name like? the mode and the taxes or something like that it sounds like these are like just really sophisticated folks that uh you're, you're on the panel with so as always we're going to start with each of the panelists doing a three-minute pitch as to where they stand on the question do we need to abandon the assumption that a university education leads to a more highly paid and valued role and eradicate current social hierarchies ben burgess thank you uh, yeah, so as not to bury the lead, I do think we need to eradicate current social hierarchies. I want to say that at the outset. That said, uh, I do also want to push back a little bit against the framing because I think it's very telling that when we think about social hierarchies, what we're really talking about in that question is the inequality between uh, people with certain kinds of good jobs that you need to go to college to do and people with other kinds of jobs. And there is a lot you can say about what's wrong with the level of inequality between those two groups in our society. I agree with that. But I don't actually think that's the most important uh, economic hierarchy structure in our society. If you think about the difference between um, somebody who's works at an Amazon warehouse where they do literally backbreaking labor, look into the injury rates, uh, and somebody who has an MBA and has an office job for Amazon and works at a nice air-conditioned office at a desk, 
you know, the second person has a vastly better life than the first person, no doubt about it, but they're both peasants compared to the guy who owns the company and, by the way, also owns his own spaceship, right? Just to put that in perspective. And so I think that any path towards a more equal society has to focus on that much bigger inequality at the, uh, at the outset by, I would argue, democratizing the economy, either by taking corporations like Amazon into, pub you know, into state ownership to run them in public interest, converting them into internally democratic. That's where, that's, sorry, that's exactly where the free trial cuts uh, yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, so the, the end of the sentence was just converting them into internally democratic worker cooperatives or some combination of the two. That's the, they, had, uh, they had to cut that off. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We don't want to know about that. Uh, so um, I will, in any case, um, so yeah, I, I think you have to subscribe right now to their service. That's the Institute for Art and Ideas that runs the, this festival every year um, That uh, to get that full debate right now. Uh, but uh, for anybody who's uh, watching this uh, very late at night for you uh, in, uh, in the UK, uh, if you're going to be in Wales at the end of May, so like May 28th and 29th, uh, I am going to be back there. So I, I guess I'm, I'm willing, you know, they're willing to have me back for a second year of being, you know, I would say the person who gets to say, you know, crazy communist things at the stages. That, hey, but, you know, they're, they're, they do have a Slovenian person for that also. And, uh, uh, and Corey Dockton. What's that? And Cory Doctorow is going to. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Who uh, who just wrote a book called like uh, Chow Point Capitalism? But anyway, they have a. Uh, so um, so yeah, and then I guess there's also I guess there's also uh, Aaron Bastati. I think was there at least last year. So there, there's a, uh, you know, there there are there are a few uh, there are a few Reds who are allowed there. But in any case, uh, I am going to be uh, back there um, at the end of May. So uh, again, if you uh, are going to be in the UK, then want to go, going to do I think th three events in total. Uh, so uh, one of them is a panel uh, with uh, uh, another philosophy professor and a physicist called "The Best of All Possible Worlds," uh, which is a sort of lighter, more fun thing, talking about um, you know, sort of. Uh, public fascination with like many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and, you know, uh, you know, alternate dimensions, movies and all that stuff. Uh, and then uh, also doing, uh, so that's on the 20, May 28th, May 20, also May 28th, I believe. Uh, there's like, a, um, you know, I don't know, it's like, you know, have cake and champagne to talk about philosophy thing. Uh, that uh, that doing uh, and then um, and then on uh, the next day on May 29th uh, there's uh, I'm giving a lecture there called uh, Marx uh, Marx deserves uh, better critics uh, so um, which uh, I suppose is self-explanatory so I don't think it's actually in the uh, I don't think it is in the episode description right now but we'll put all that in the episode description. Um, but uh, before that, uh, I want to um, I want to bring in Matt, and um, and I will see Jake and Andy in the post game. Uh, but. Um, as we uh, as we bring in Matt, uh, I do want uh, to uh, I do want to play uh, the um, uh, the greatest mind of 2023, mm. giving his his thoughts about Heidegger. Do we uh, do we have this? I know I cut this, but we might. I don't oh, see no, it right now. But we're gonna have it in a second, so right, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. All right. Well, everybody's gonna have to be in suspense about this. Uh, but uh, well, uh, well, we upload the clip. But not McManus. Um, anybody who uh, anybody who is a regular GTA viewer knows who this man is. But for people who are not, Matt, who are you? 
Uh, yeah, thanks. It's great to be back. It's been a while, actually. Um, but um, I'm a legal lecturer at the University of Michigan, uh, and I alternate between defending democratic socialism and writing painful commentaries uh, on the political right. Uh, so whichever prong of my work uh, you may like, I encourage you to check that out. Yeah, I should say uh, that um, uh, for, you know, look, as... Uh, as Pink Floyd uh, has always taught us, uh, you have to eat your meat uh, before you can have your pudding. Uh, so um, we're going to be doing uh, we're going to be doing Heidegger right now in the main show, but in the post game for patrons, uh, we are going to be talking about um, you know the other aspect of uh, of what Matt does. Uh, he uh, he wrote this uh, this article uh, for uh, uh, for Jacobin uh, the other day. Uh, about um, the uh, about Rod DeSantis, uh, the uh, uh, the courage to be free. Uh, so uh, so Matt is uh, like it's 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 like a it's like a knife swallower at a carnival uh, for uh, for words. Uh, Matt uh, uh, Matt uh, reads a lot of these books, and this is one of them. Uh, and, uh, and he did. Uh, um, so he's read the courage to be free. He's, uh, he's reviewed it for, uh, for Jacobin. So, uh, we are going to be talking about that, uh, coming up, but, uh, Jake, yeah, right? we are. We, yeah. Yeah. We are introduced, introduced the video again. And, uh, audience should know that behind closed doors, I will pay for, for, for that mistake. Ben always makes me pay. So, but you, <laughs> yeah. you, you got, you guys won't have to see it. <laughs> yeah, it's it is like um, GTA has the uh, labor practices of uh, Amy Klobuchar's DC office. <laughs> uh, there are some staplers who can be thrown in anger. Um, so, uh, so yeah. All right. Uh, so we're about to get mad at Heidegger first. Let's get James Lindsay. Weird. It's kind of strange to say it, but I actually have this bad habit of rubbing my face when I'm thinking really hard. <laughs> rubbed my face so hard and so thoroughly that I rubbed a bald spot on one side of my chin, uh, not even realizing that I was doing that while I was trying to parse out this idea. Uh, It's all grown back now, but I actually rubbed, you know, this big rectangular bald spot when (laughs) I was stroking my beard too hard, trying to figure this out and understand it. And so the podcast is out there. People say it's very difficult and hopefully over time I can kind of simplify the arguments within it and help people see it. But, um, I think that, that to it. I thought it was fantastic. I thought she that's the really key. Job. Um, yep. there, there were several things that came up for me. Uh, one, I just want to comment on this whole notion of, uh, tearing down. Uh, I, I think it's really relevant to say that a lot of people don't realize when they say build back better, uh, first, you have to tear down in order to build back. That's the part they leave out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other thing that came up for me is I feel like I need to reread Heidegger um, because I don't know how familiar you are with his works, but it seems like he was very clearly, very heavily influenced by both Marx and uh, Hegel in a very uh, theological way. Yeah, actually, I think that's probably important. Uh, One of them, I'm, you know, I'm not exactly as expert in Heidegger as I need to be for what's going on. Okay, so ten out of ten. I just, uh, I don't know. I mean, he sat there and he's like, "This podcast is really very difficult," and I personally think that the easiest way to understand James Lindsay would be just to get a giant bag of cocaine, do as much of it as you can, like a true least Scarface level quantity. And believe me, race Marxism would probably make a ton more sense. And I'm sure many other things would be revealed to you as well. Yeah. Um, or maybe uh, The Departed, the, uh, <laughs> the the mixing bowl of Coke, the Jack, uh, Jack Nicholson's character in The Departed uh, uh, says, you know, was a stick your face in here until you're numb. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it just throws it all over everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, so uh, I should say this this clip actually for James Lindsay. This there's a remarkable amount of intellectual humility going on in this clip. 
he he said he's not as expert at Heidegger as he should be. I mean, this is a man who what did he claim once that he reads he reads uh, like critical race theory for like sixteen hours a day or something. Yeah, he also says he knows vastly more about left wing philosophy than ninety percent of left wing philosophers out there. Which, having read his work on it, I can tell you is either a blatant lie or a self lie of a very high order. Can't really say which. Uh, again, you know, all that nose candy can do fun things to a man uh, and what he thinks about himself. But who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, allegedly parody. Sure. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I don't. Um... I don't want anybody to, um, I don't, you know, anybody who's in the audience right now who's thinking about taking in some Heidegger, I don't want them to have to like rub unsightly spots in their beards from, from, uh, them too hard, uh, and, uh, in deep thought as we all, as we all do. Um, so, uh, I thought that I would, uh, I would bring in somebody who writes about this a lot. Uh, we have, uh, actually, I don't think we even have all of them here, but we have a, uh, a few of them, right? The things that you've written about this, uh, over the years. Uh, so, uh, there is this, uh, from, let's see, this is, uh, some oh. yeah. uh, uh, why the contemporary right loves Nietzsche and Heidegger and Schmidt, uh, there is uh, this old one, um, uh, Why We Should Read Heidegger. Uh, there's uh, Heidegger's Philosophy and Fascism. Uh, there's one that's like just a couple months old, Liberal Currents, uh, called Heidegger's Critique of Liberalism. So it seems like, I think, yeah, I think when I was looking at this earlier, I, I saw Matt McManus Heidegger articles from 2018, 2019. 2021 i don't know what happened in 2020 i think you might have i think you might have missed <laughs> Took a year off. article uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there was definitely one this year there might have been one 2022 so it seems like about once a year on average you know unless there's a global pandemic uh you'll uh you'll write a uh, a heidegger article uh so you've you spent a lot of time thinking about this mm -hmm. and you know i, I should say like you know, I, I kind of roughly think of like interviews I do on the show as falling into a couple of categories. Like sometimes it's like something that um, I just have somebody on because they know vastly more about something than I do and I want to hear from them about it. Sometimes, you know, they have takes, I have takes. It's like, ah, come on, we'll talk about it. Uh, this is like maybe somewhere in between. I think it's closer to the first one. Like I, I think I, I definitely have thoughts. Um I've uh, I've actually been reading a little bit about Heidegger lately. It's one of the reasons that I thought it'd be interesting to do this episode. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, you've spent vastly more time uh, thinking about this guy than I have. I mean, you know, I had to read a little bit of Heidegger in graduate school. I, I've uh, uh, recently kind of gone back to that stuff a little bit. Uh, just uh, uh, just read a uh, a book uh about heidegger uh uh which is a very entertaining book much hated uh by uh, by a lot of heidegger fans uh paul edwards uh <laughs> heidegger's confusions uh which the the title kind of says it all mm -hmm. um but uh and you know i think at my most unsympathetic moments I think okay look if there's one philosopher that you would sort of like like one like major philosopher that you would sort of wish out of the canon, uh, then maybe the guy who kind of pioneered this impenetrable writing style and was also literally a Nazi uh, would be the one that you would pick. That would be like my sort of most uncharitable thought about Heidegger. Uh, but he's also a figure who's been really important to uh, some thinkers on the left. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. you know if it's, if it's like an obvious case. Uh, his, his somebody who has said things that like lots of people, like, you know, lots of like people who are like do philosophy of mind, who come from like thoroughly analytic kind of philosophy kind of background, like, you know, see uh, insights, you know, in, in, in Heidegger that, you know, that they, they run with. So, um, 
you know, I don't know. If, if nothing else, maybe, you know, out of, you know, the entire membership as of 1934 or whatever of the, uh, of, uh, the Nazi party, uh, you know, uh, probably the one with the most enduring intellectual interest. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I want to say there's a reason I write quite a lot about Heidegger. Uh, and just to uh, clarify a few things, I was writing a lot about Heidegger in 2020. Uh, it just all put, appeared in my book on postmodernity. Uh, so there's a big, long section on him there. Uh, and there's also a big, long section on him uh, in my book on the political right. So every year has this little uh, Heidegger output. Uh, but just, you know, it's by way of personal background. Uh, there is a reason for this fixation. Uh, I actually considered myself a Heideggerian uh, until I was about 25, I think. Uh, Reason being, it's a very cliched story, you know, lost my Catholic faith. Uh, and I very naively thought to myself, well, I will just go and learn philosophers. Uh, and then I'll find the philosopher who is right, because obviously it's just that simple, right? You find the one who's objectively correct about everything. And then that will be my new belief system. Uh, and I started off with Nietzsche, dived into Kant, uh, really liked Kant, but found him a little bit boring, as you do when you're 18, 19 years old. Uh, and then I read Being in Time, uh, mostly on the bus going back from work, actually, uh, usually late at night. Uh, never forget that. Uh, it was a really tough book. Uh, I mean, everyone agrees about that. But there was just something that was so electrifying uh, about it. And in fact, the toughness was almost part of the appeal because you almost felt like you were being entered into this secret way of looking at things. Uh, and I think that that's intentional, actually, on his part. Uh, he's really trying to redefine the grammar uh, in which we philosophize because he thinks that normal words through which we philosophize aren't really capable of uttering uh, the kind of profound thoughts that he has. Uh, and there's something very entrancing uh, about that uh, when you're younger. Now, later on, uh, as I started going more and more into it uh, and also reading more Marx, more Rawls, I became more critical. Uh, and then when a lot of that stuff about the Nazi connection came in and I started looking at it seriously, I became actually really disturbed. Uh, but he's a very interesting guy. Uh, I don't think that I would never tell anyone not to read him. And I do mm -hmm. think qua your common uh, that there are things that leftist mm -hmm. philosophers and indeed just philosophers generally can pick up from his work. Uh, as Alexander Duff points out in his book on Heidegger's politics, Heidegger's thinking is not at all coextensive uh, with Nazism. There's a lot you can pick up from. But he was a Nazi. There's no denying that. And he there is a very clear connection between his thinking and the ideology of national socialism um and we'll definitely have to talk a little bit about that since that's yeah, what i tend to focus I, on now yeah that last that last point is one that's worth circling the underlining right that like there's a it's not um because like maybe there's like a kind of dumb way of connecting the two like okay heidegger's a nazi therefore like yeah his every thought is like a you know his you know his every thought has like I don't know, you know, intellectual Nazi cooties on it, you know, uh, but uh, that is clearly wrong. But I, I also tend to think there is like, you know, because obviously the fact that, you know, Heidegger, I mean, again, was literally a Nazi and, you know, had, had, had made, uh, uh, you know, was, was a was a party member that, you know, that, that he, he'd made you know, all these statements about how this was this wonderful renewal of the German nation, whatever, like mm -hmm. that was all a matter of public record forever. Uh, there's, there's like more recent stuff. that's even worse. It's, you know, come oh, yeah. out since like the eighties, but uh, the sort of party line among his, his many defenders for decades was that that's um, that that's like a, uh, you know, it's, it's like, is almost to treat it as if this were like a, I don't know, like the political equivalent of like a drug problem or something that like, just, just something that's like, should, shouldn't reflect, you know, on the, the work itself. This is just like a separate subject. You know, this is like finding out that like a novelist, you know, was like a, you know, did something terrible in his personal life or something that has nothing to do with the novels. Uh, and, you know, and I think it's, I think it's worth, you know, I mean, we'll, as you said, we'll, we'll come back to this, but you know, I, I think there is, a pretty obvious case to be made um, and honestly was even before all of the stuff that's, you know, kind of come out over the last few decades. That's, that's worse that no, like there is at least a non coincidental connection between like central themes of the philosophical work and the reactionary politics. Oh yeah. Um, I used to get angry emails from people when I'd write about this being like, there's no connection between Heidegger and Nazism. And I actually have one guy say, I want you to publicly apologize for that, making <laughs> the association. 
And I was like, you know, if there is no association between Heidegger and Nazism, then boy, oh boy, did he struggle to get one in there. Because I would think that joining the Nazi party, saying that people should support Hitler, encouraging students to support Hitler, and then writing a variety of books depending the inner truth and greatness uh, of the National Socialist Movement would constitute at least a kind of support for Nazism. But maybe that's just my naive and inauthentic way uh, of looking at things. But right. look, you know, before we really dive into the intellectual nuts and bolts here, uh, yeah. I do want to make clear uh, that I'm not saying cancel Heidegger, right? right. Uh, I think that there is there are a lot of philosophically interesting things in his work that can be dislocated uh, from his political connections, particularly a lot of the stuff that he writes about existential phenomenology and division one and being in time. Uh, you know, Herbert Dreyfus wrote some very interesting things, so did Gilbert Ryle, about that division, mainly in the philosophy of mind uh, and also uh, existential phenomenology. You could take that from an entirely apolitical standpoint, as I do. Yeah. Uh, there's also ways of drawing upon some of his more clearly political thought in a way that turns it in a more radical direction, right? Uh, I mean, Herbert Marcuse did that quite successfully in his early work. Jacques Derrida did that uh, through his pioneering approach to deconstruction or deconstruction, which was originally a term. And fucking famously, Sartre did that, right? I mean, Sartre was a French Marxist, about as radical as you can get. Uh, being a nothingness is very clearly intended uh, as a kind of compliment uh, or correction uh, to being in time. So by all means, anybody out there, I'm saying, read Heidegger, read him carefully, yeah. draw what you want from him. Uh, but I think what people like myself or Ron Beaner uh, or, you know, Richard Bolin are saying is just be aware of his own inclinations. And if you do decide to read him as a liberal or a progressive or however it is you want, you're doing so against the grain of what he considered to be the most true interpretation of his thinking. Yeah. And I think there's also something to be said about um, anti-rationalism uh, and uh, oh, definitely, yeah. um, you know the idea that like you have to go back to like the, some kind of primordial civilizational source that you know is uh, uh, that's like you know been obscured by all this you know all this fancy intellectualism you know over the millennia that you know it's it's not again. I, I think is non coincidentally thematically related to, to the fact that, you know, fascism would be appealing to him. Uh, but yeah, I, I do want to maybe start out though on, uh, on the less directly political uh, mm -hmm. aspects of, uh, of his work. So, you know, if we, you know, if we think, you know, about like, you know, you already mentioned uh, being in time, uh, like, <laughs> you know, what's the, uh, uh, you know, how, you know, I assume everybody, you know, everybody who's watching this uh, saw that we we're going to do Heidegger tonight. And so they spent the last week uh, reading Being in Time and it's, it's, it's fresh in their heads. <laughs> uh, but just in case there's like one or two people who somehow didn't do that. Uh, like, like what's the, like, like what's the project of that book? What's the sort of basic thing he's doing? Well, the main project in Being a Time, and indeed his work as a whole, is to interrogate the meaning of being, right? Uh, or human beings relation to being. Uh, we're going to say that word a lot, boy, oh boy, right? Uh, and he lays this out very clearly in the introduction, uh, which is one of the great introductions in the history of German philosophy, uh, alongside, I would say, uh, the introduction to the contributions of uh, the critique of political economy and also Hegel's uh, preface to the phenomenology of spirit, because it's really central to understanding the work as a whole. Uh, and what's important about this introduction is he's very clearly enacting a shift away from this very German, uh, and for that matter, very uh, European focus on epistemology, uh, which had been the kind of dominant philosophical genre, if you want to call it that, at least in Heidegger's interpretation, from at least Descartes onward, uh, and refocusing it around ontology. Uh, and the promise of the introduction is actually not fully met, oddly enough, in this book, because he lays out this very interesting set of provocations saying, we're going to interrogate the meaning of being, we're going to do it concretely. Our provisional aim will be and trying to understand the nature of time and its relationship to Dasein, right? Uh, us, basically. Uh, and then he says, before I get into any of all that and talk about the meaning of being, we have to talk about that being for whom the question of being is important. Uh, I told you we'd say that word a lot, which is us, right? We are the ones who raise these kinds of questions. And so then he dives into these very interesting uh, phenomenological 
ruminations about human beings interact with the world. Uh, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds of this because we'll be fucking here forever. And everyone has their own take about this. Uh, yeah. You know, their pragmatic takes, their existential takes, yada, yada, yada. The core idea is, is that he picks up important insights in the Husserlian phenomenological tradition, uh, which talk about how it is that human consciousness is always consciousness of something. Uh, and he says there are insights here, but the problem is it doesn't really go far enough. Husserl and phenomenology are already smuggling in notions of consciousness and rationality into something that needs to be understood in a much more existentially primordial way. Uh, and again, moving very quickly, uh, he says that at the epicenter, or as he calls it in the translation I read, at least the structural primordiality of human beings isn't consciousness, let alone reason, let alone Kantian reason or Husserlian reason. Uh, it's what he calls care, right? That is what structurally is primordial to us. And this is really important because he says, look, before you can be conscious of something uh, or before you can experience the world in some way, let alone before you do anything in the world, you have to care about it, right? You have to bring that level of meaning into your interactions with the world and indeed into your interactions with yourself. Uh, and then he talks about care in a lot of very interesting ways uh, in the first part of the book uh, that we don't need to get into. There's all kinds of interesting stuff about present to hand uh, and ready to hand stuff. Uh, but what's important is then he enacts this big shift, which is actually bring us to the politics, whether or not you might think it, later on in the book. Uh, and he says that care has a threefold quality to it that not coincidentally coincides with the way human beings experience time. Uh, and then what we realize this book is really about is about how human beings are in his mind, to his mind at least, a kind of embodied time. Uh, so care is always this stretching either back into the past or forwards to the future, and that helps define us in the present. And the, if that sounds really fucking weird, it is. Uh, but I usually give the example of a hockey game, because of course I fucking would. <laughs> I'm Canadian, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, where Heidegger says, look, think about it like this. There's this Western tradition of understanding time in linear terms that he associates for the most part with Kant, right? Especially in his later book, Kant and the Problem of Transcendental Idealism. And he says, people think of time as moving linearly, linearly, excuse me, for human beings. And he says, actually, if you're playing hockey, for example, you're very much drawing upon this deep reservoir of skills and memories and inclinations and habits that can go way, way back in time for you, especially mm -hmm. if you're a good player and you've been doing this for a long time, right? Uh, and that is all there with you in the present. But at the same moment, you're not just living in the present with all those memories. You're projecting yourself ahead of where you are right now and thinking, do I need to pass the puck to that person? If I pass it to him, uh, you know, he'll check that person and then we'll be able to get it in with, the, you know, because the goal is not paying too much attention and he's kind of a drunk anyway, who gives a shit, right? Uh, so this ahead of ourselves is also an important dimension of time. Uh, and Heidegger says, you wouldn't be able to apprehend it unless you understand the structural primordiality of human beings as care, because it's care that causes us to go back, to draw upon that reservoir of meanings and understandings and experiences so that we can live in the present. And of course, care is also a kind of hope, right? Uh, we have aspirations in the future that direct how we're thinking about things in the present. Uh, and this is what he calls an ecstatic concept of time. It's one that's constantly um, in motion between its different dimensions, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and personally, I still think that this is probably true from a phenomenological perspective. Uh, I don't think that you can make a generalization about this to say physics, for example. And I think if you did, you'd get some pretty fucking kooky stuff from it. Uh, but I do think it's the case that, you know, we draw upon the past uh, to frame what we're doing in the present. And that's also itself determined by what we hope for in the future. I think that he's probably right about that. Yeah. So there, there are a couple different things going on here uh, because a lot of what you're describing doesn't really sound like being and time. And we probably should spend just a minute at some point soon about what, yeah. on what being uh, means either with when it in the singular with the capital B mm -hmm. or the plural with the lower little B. Uh, but um, it's, it sounds like, I don't know, like experience in time or, you know, something like that, yep. right? They, you know, you know, psychology. You'd be really angry to hear you say that, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause yeah, a lot of what we're talking about here is psychology and, you know, you, you'd sort of said something in passing, which uh, about Dasein where you said us more or less, uh, but uh, yeah. 
which uh, is also, you know, I, I think could also be confusing because I mean, just, just on a really simple minded level here, like, I, I think one of the things that, you know, certainly Lady Four as I've managed to read Heidegger gets very confused and very fast is when are we doing metaphysics, right? When are we talking about um, what's sort of objectively true regardless of human experience and when are we and when are we doing something like more like philosophical psychology, you know, that uh, that, that we're talking about um, you know, we're we're talking about, you know, we're maybe saying interesting things about, you know, human experience, but you know, but then we are definitely talking about um human experience because you know because when, when he talks um like there seems to be a lot of time when he's he's talking he is talking about being you know he's he's talking about metaphysics you know he'll say things mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm, you know have i don't know he'll, he'll like go on and not in certain places about pieces of chalk and classrooms and you know things that things that don't have experiences themselves, right? That's not what we're talking about. And they say that uh, there's this like really mysterious quality of them that they participate in, in being that, you know, they have like, there's the chalk, there's like the whiteness of the chalk and it's, you know, other, you know, physical, pro- you know, perceptible properties, but it also has this, uh, you know, it, it also has this like special property, you know, well, I'm already mangling it, right? Mm-hmm. You know, but it, it also... There is, because he, uh, there are places, as people have pointed out to me, right? You know, when, when I've, I've made the mistake of talking about Heidegger on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. You're going to get a fucking load of people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, you know, there are definitely places where he, he explicitly sort of takes on Kant's point about existence not being a property. Although, uh, what that means for Heidegger is I think at, at the very least unclear to me, uh, like 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 what like what he's reading into that word property uh, is I, I I don't feel like I fully understand, but uh, but but he will say things of the format. Uh, okay, they're beans, mm-hmm. us pieces of chalk, cats, whatever, uh, uh, classrooms, and then there's bean uh, singular with a capital B. That's this different thing. Um, this is uh, actually uh, to uh, you know reference a book that's maybe less significant in the long run than being in time. Uh, Twelve Rules for Life. Uh, every every time the word "bean" is used in there, it has the capital B as a Heidegger tribute. Um, then uh, and Jordan Peterson likes to talk about bean, although. I think he thinks he means what Heidegger means. It's very, it, it doesn't really seem to me like what he means is what Heidegger means. He'll say things like Antifa does violence because they're angry at God for the crime of being, which makes it sound like, you know, you're talking about being in terms of this like causal relationship, right? God brings things into being, which doesn't quite seem to be what Heidegger is talking about. Um, but, uh, but I should say, before throwing it back to you to tell us what Heidegger is talking about, as you would understand it, um, that you know he'll say all of these things that make it seem like he thinks this this issue about being in the capital B sense is like the most important thing ever, and there's something mm-hmm. that's like, you know, he he sort of talks about. I mean, it's funny you were saying that you know you uh, got into Heidegger, you know, as as the you know sort of I don't know, like the heroin methadone transition from Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, um, you know, he sort of talks like a medieval mystic sometimes. Oh, yeah. About being and how, you know, that how people in, you know, societies that exist now have, have like, uh, not only don't understand being, they've, they've regressed to this point where they don't even understand the question. You know, they've forgotten they've forgotten about being and in some ways he's going to shepherd us to, to recovering, you know, what the question is. So, so I, I guess just like bluntly, like what the fuck is he talking about? Well, nobody really knows what he's talking about. Uh, and that's in part for all the reasons that you listed, right? Uh, many people point out that Heidegger went through a similar transition to Nietzsche in that he started out being quite religious 
uh, did he transition to a kind of militant atheism, uh, but elements of that religiosity uh, and mystical sensibility always stamped his work. Now, I think the clearest work uh, where he addresses this uh, is also his most Nazi work, which is very disturbing, uh, the introduction to metaphysics, where he talks about one of the ways that you can ask the question of being, and there's a lot of different ways you can ask the question of being for Heidegger, is saying, why is there something instead of nothing at all, right? Uh, and that's a very general way of asking it. Uh, but the way that it comes up most pertinently in Being in Time, and this will actually help lead us into the politics, uh, is thinking about human finitude uh, in relationship to the infinitude, if you want, of time. Uh, and recognizing that you are not big B being, but just A being that will ultimately be annihilated, right, uh, is very important in inculcating right. in you a kind of religious sensibility or something that can be considered a secularized religious sensibility. Uh, which is also, by the way, what I think Peterson is trying to do. So there is the connection that way. Although Heidegger is a much deeper thinker uh, than Peterson is in every respect. But let's let's kind of dive into that, sure. actually, because I think yeah. that's important. So the early bits of being in time, Division I, uh, I tend to agree with like Herbert Dreyfus, are pretty easy to decouple from his broader political project. Even if you have to be very careful about doing so. Uh, and I think that in some respects, he offers some very useful critiques of the philosophy of the subject uh, while remaining within it, and I think you're right about that, uh, that anybody can pick up on, right? Uh, and he made a good contribution to phenomenology. Things get more interesting and more problematic when we get to the next parts of being in time, though, uh, which is the more existential part, where he becomes very influenced by Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, uh, and less overtly by the history of um, conservative revolutionary thought in uh, Germany, right? There's a big stamp of that as well. But broadly speaking, Heidegger is going to say, look, we are defined by this kind of care that stretches outwards in every direction, right? Uh, and this is demonstrated in the kind of life projects that we commit ourselves to. Now, he wouldn't use that term, but I'm just going to use it. Think about the hockey game again, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, this is something that you are doing in the course of the day. Uh, and you have to be extended ahead of yourself and behind yourself in order to do it successfully. Right. But somewhere in the back of my, your mind, in my mind, is an awareness of the fact that though time might be ecstatic, it's not infinite for us. Right. That there is a finitude to our lives uh, and that we are all going to be annihilated. Uh, and I will say Heidegger is quite chilling about this, uh, where he will often use that term, at least in translation, right, where we will pass from out of nothing and back into nothing. That's kind of a defining feature of human existence. Uh, and this generates a lot of angst uh, on our part, right? Um, this is sometimes translated as anxiety uh, or angst, uh, but it's ultimately a term from, uh, that he plagiarized from Kierkegaard and didn't give him nearly enough credit for. Uh, some people might have read the concept of anxiety. But when we feel this kind of angst, it can provoke us to respond in a wide variety of different ways, uh, some of which he talks about. Uh, now, a more positive way of responding to this angst uh, would be to live what he calls authentically. And this is where we're starting to get into really dangerous territory. Uh, because again, influenced by this conservative revolutionary thought, not everyone is going to live authentically, right? There'll be a kind of rarefied elite that will choose to live authentically. Uh, but most people won't have the will to do this, right? Or the strength to do this. Uh, they will retreat into the world of dasman, right? Uh, or average everydayness in this crude pejorative sense, uh, which he associates with urban life in big cities. Uh, particularly big social democratic cities like Berlin, which he detested, right? Where you see a kind of mass culture emerging. And he means mass culture in the pejorative sense that it's always described with uh, when it comes to German revolutionaries, right? Democratic, venal, rule of the mediocre, right? People just engaged in what he calls idle, meaningless chatter uh, about unimportant things. Uh, and in these kinds of contexts, it can be very difficult for these kinds of exceptional uh, moments to emerge where you can genuinely live authentically, right? Uh, and he's deeply worried about that because he thinks that in the modern world, uh, particularly one that increasingly seems to be governed by planetary technology, yes, but also liberalism and socialism as a kind of ruling ideologies or ruling political ideologies associated with planetary technology, uh, it's going to become more and more an inauthentic kind of world. Uh, and he's going to eventually start to see in Nazism a kind of a safety valve or an escape valve uh, from this. Uh, and that leads us, I think, pretty nicely into um, his politics. But that's yeah. kind of the transition, I think, that takes place uh, in being in time. 
Uh, oh, and I think there's one other important thing that I should note here. Uh, many people interpreted being in time, the sign, being there and being in time, uh, as a purely individualistic uh, yeah. kind of examination of human beings' existential relationship to being, right? However, if you read Being in Time closely, uh, at the end, he expressly says, this is, the sign is not purely an individualistic notion. Uh, it always needs to be understood in these very collective, nationalistic, volkish terms. Uh, and this raises the question, he says, at the very conclusion, of collective authenticity on the part of the nation. Uh, pretty chilling. And Yeah, I mean, this is, the, I mean, honestly, it kind of makes me think of uh, something I think George Orwell actually says about uh, the Nazis that is like, uh, you know, what does he say? It's like the, uh, the promise of socialism and in a different way of liberal capitalism, this, you know, is, is ultimately, I'll give you a good time. Uh, the, uh, the yeah. promise the you know, uh, the promise of Hitler was, you know, I'll give you suffering and death and uh, fulfills the promise and, you know, entire nation lays itself on his feet or something like that. Right. It's like, I'm, I'm mangling the quote, right? But it's it's like along those lines. And, and I think the point that Orwell's getting at is that there's the sort of like um, very explicitly part of the appeal of fascist politics is that is the sort of non, uh, you know, not instrumental. It's like not that like politics is this way of like getting you things that you want, you know, but it's, it's that uh, it, it's something closer to what you're talking about. That there's a, uh, that it's like, oh, this is going to be this like, more authentic form of life and like mad, you know, there's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing that's more authentic than suffering. Oh, absolutely. Right. Uh, and this becomes really clear in his work in the 1930s, where he becomes even more influenced by Nietzsche than he was in being in time, uh, drops a lot of the interest in people like Kant and Husserl, uh, and of course really enters into his Nazi phase. Uh, and I want to be clear about this. This was an enthusiastic embrace, at least for a few years. Right. Yeah. Uh, there are two things that people should read if they want to understand this. Uh, there's the rectoral address uh, where he lays out his vision uh, of a new German Volk and encourages his students to support Hitler and Hitlerism. Uh, horrible piece, right? Uh, just damning to the upteenth degree, right? The more interesting one, though, uh, is his piece, Introduction to Metaphysics, particularly the first bit of Introduction to Metaphysics, where... He talks about the role that he thinks um, Nazism is supposed to play in the world and who the rivals uh, of the Nazi regime are. And here I want to make a slightly technical point, but it's an important yeah. one. Again, I think that there's a materialist way of reading Division One of Being in Time uh, that people like, say, Merleau-Ponty uh, or Jean-Paul Sartre take up. Uh, and that would probably be the safest way to make the insights of Heideggerianism palatable for the left. Heidegger doesn't go that route. Uh, he instead goes the route of every, uh, almost every, with the exception of Nietzsche, major German conservative revolutionary, and he just leaps headfirst into idealism to the fucking umpteenth degree. Because now he's starting to develop this philosophy of history uh, beyond just focusing on the historicity of the sign. It's now really uh, trying to understand the different epochs uh, through which humanity has progressed, each one of which is defined by this metaphysical way of conceiving being, uh, which is a very grandiose way of thinking about things if you're a philosopher, since, of course, if you think that the primary things that define any epoch are its metaphysical sensitivities, yeah. then of course that gives a very privileged role for philosophers uh, to yeah. play in the kind of society that they're a part of, since they alone have an understanding of the kind of Rosetta Stone uh, through which everything else can be understood. Yeah, uh, and the Marxists again me thought about this uh, for a long time. That it's like I think part of the reason that like something like idealism is always so good, so appealing to philosophers. It's like, of course it fucking would be. It's like the, uh, it's like the, you can, it's like, it's like, Hey, you want the, uh, do you want the view of history that says that like what you're doing is basically epiphenomenal or do you want the view of history that says that like, that you're right at the heart of the thing that's the most important for understanding everything that ever happens. Yeah, exactly. And this is where Heidegger gets really, the only way to describe it is pretty funny, right? Because the more pompous he gets, uh, the more, inflated uh, his expectations of the regime and himself become, uh, and the bigger the fall uh, that ultimately enacts, uh, emerges. But, you know, introduction to metaphysics lays this all out in actually surprisingly clear detail. Like, I'm not saying it's an easy book, but compared to being in time, certainly that first chapter is pretty easygoing. 
Uh, but he says, look, you know, we've entered into a nihilistic epoch. The rule of planetary technology is everywhere present. Planetary technology is defined by this nihilistic sensibility where human beings adopt the subject object relationship to the world and just see everything uh, as a kind of standing reserve uh, to be manipulated to gratify human needs. Uh, and the appropriate political systems for this nihilistic outlook are liberalism, socialism, and democracy. Uh, now, this is going to piss a lot of people off, but like a lot of people on the far right, uh, he says that these are all essentially one and the same. Uh, and I think here he's really a very inferior interpreter compared to someone like Nietzsche, who had a lot more interesting things to say about this. But the reason they'll say things like, look, liberalism, socialism, and democracy are all metaphysically the same uh, are because he says, look, ultimately, communists and liberals or capitalists are just debating about the technical ways to go about expropriating everything in the world to put it to human needs, right? The, mm -hmm. the capitalists have a very technical way of thinking about that predicated on free markets. The communists have their way of thinking about how we can best mobilize the resources of the earth to satisfy human needs. But at the epicenter, they're the same metaphysical outlook, right? Uh, and they also have this democratic quality to them in that they're both humanisms, right? They both think that ultimately we should try to give as many people as much stuff as possible and that will make them happy. Uh, and he's emphatically uh, contemptuous of that because he thinks that uh, Germany uh, as the most specialist country in the world, right? The country of the center, the one that's more spiritually attuned, all this very pulpy Nazi rhetoric uh, alone uh, can serve as a kind of bulk work uh, against Russia and America. And eventually, hopefully, a new world order uh, will emerge in, as part of the new German Reich uh, or as the new German Reich ascends in power. Uh, and this will lead to the collapse of liberalism and socialism and potentially uh, a transition to a new, less nihilistic epoch. Uh, and Heidegger said some truly appalling things uh, in line with this way of thinking uh, about things. Uh, and sometimes very transparently contradictory things. Uh, so for instance, uh, when the Nazis occupied France in the 1940s, uh, he famously wrote a letter saying, well, this vindicates my theory, because of course it does, right? We've entered into a new era, Nazi arms and the spirit of the German people have prevailed against their technologically oriented, nihilistic, decadent liberal enemies, huzzah. And then of course, at the end of the Second World War, uh, he was like, well, this doesn't really settle anything, right? The <laughs> fact that Germany was occupied by the wretched Americans and Soviets and is now literally divided between them, I will still be vindicated uh, in the long run, right? <laughs> Give me a couple of centuries. And you're like, sure thing. Um, and you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg, really. Probably for me, the most awful thing that he ever said. Uh, well, there were two things. Uh, one was when he was pressed to say something about the Holocaust, which if you think about it, seems to embody at least elements of his thinking better than many other things that you can think of, right? There's a literal reduction of human beings into objects uh, and their mass incineration by industrial techniques. Uh, he actually makes that connection, uh, but then he says, look, you know, ultimately, you know, the Holocaust is just of a piece with agricultural farming uh, because these, are two th these two things are metaphysically the same. There's that idealism again. Uh, and so we shouldn't be paying too much attention to the Holocaust uh, because we're perfectly comfortable with industrial farming, right? Yeah, it's the uh, the uh, it's, uh, Jean Marie Le Pen de la thing, right? That's uh, it's a detail of the history of the Second World War. Exactly right, uh, and another even more crass kind of exoneration that he tries to wheel out uh, is when he says things like, "Well, you know." The Sudeten Germans also had it rough at the end uh, of the Second World War. The Second Sudeten Germans were kind of forced to emigrate from the Sudetenland into Germany proper. Yeah, uh, he and has. Uh, it's the um, so there are these things. Uh, we actually did a bonus episode about this. I don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, where uh, uh, looked at uh, looked at these letters uh, back and forth between between Heidegger and his extremely disappointed uh, former student uh, Marcuse, uh, who uh, is uh, you know is saying uh, hey buddy uh, you um, like you supported uh, this uh, psychotic mass murderous uh, dictatorship that uh, 
tried to take over the world and uh, exterminated millions of people for sharing my ethnicity. Um, can you maybe spell out for me that you at least feel bad about that now? Uh, and, and he doesn't quite uh, in, uh, in his responses. And I remember that was part of it that he was like, well, you know, look at all the bad things the Soviets did to, you know, to like Germans in Eastern Europe after World War II. So it's like, hey, while we're throwing things around, it's like, you know, it's like, ah, Germans did bad things, you know, Russians did bad things, whatever, man. Oh, yeah, like it's Fox News whataboutism. Uh, and you'd expect that from fucking Tucker Carlson uh, or even from, you know, Jordan Peterson or something. Uh, not from a thinker like Heidegger who, say whatever you will about him, took himself really very seriously uh, to a truly clownish degree at points. Uh, but, you know, I also want to say he did give a final interview uh, in 1971, I think it was, maybe 1972 for Der Spiegel, uh, that he allowed, uh, where he allowed um, the interviewees to talk to him about his politics and what happened during the um, Nazi regime, on condition that the interview not be published until after he passed away. Uh, and it's a really revealing interview uh, because he does kind of acknowledge that, yeah, maybe I've made a few personal errors, uh, but it's all in a very academic, scholarly he who thinks great thoughts will make great errors kind of ways. Uh, and it kind of vacillates between this very grandiose sense of himself as the voice or the mouth or the prophet uh, of being uh, and some truly mundane academies. Uh, and these two lines of rhetorical justification do not sit well with one another. Uh, I mean, one of the other points where he tries to apologize, I don't want to call it that, but downplay what he does is he says, anybody who listened to my Nietzsche lectures between in the late 1930s uh, would see that there was clearly a confrontation with national socialism in those Nietzsche lectures. I mean, I never criticized national socialism per se, but they would know if they were sitting in on that because, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, and you think, yeah, you know, you're so brave, right? To be fucking <laughs> reading these esoteric Nietzsche criti like uh, context and, offer crit veiled criticisms of the regime that way. Uh, but the most telling notion uh, is where he says, I'm still not convinced that democracy, and he uses that term in a very inclusive way, uh, very compassing way, excuse me, uh, is the be all and end wall. And then he implies that, look, these issues are settled in centuries, uh, not in decades or even, you know, um, over the course of a single century. And the implication really seems to be that history will vindicate me, right? Uh, it will realize that I made the wrong judgment call about Nazism uh, as the solution to the problems of totalitarian nihilism. Uh, in fact, he says, you know, now I realize that Nazism was just yet another indication of planetary nihilism. Uh, so I was right, but just I made the wrong judgment call in this instance, right? The bigger picture is still correct. Uh, and, you know, once it's people wake up to the bigger story that I'm trying to tell, uh, they'll also realize that we need to get rid of liberalism, socialism, democracy, uh, and progress towards something that, you know, will look kind of like a fascistic politics or a nationalist politics. Who knows? He doesn't really get into specifics, right? So yeah. all that's to say, right? Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from Heidegger. I really think that being in time has a lot of intellectual resources that anyone uh, could profit from engaging with. Uh, get a good guide to it, though, because it's a hard book. Uh, I also like some of the stuff that he writes about um, the history of philosophy. I have problems with it, but there's definitely a lot of interesting essays that he writes about Parmenides and Plato and Nietzsche. It's all worthwhile stuff to go through. Uh, but again, just be very aware, in my opinion, that if you are picking up his thinking, uh, that it can lead you to some very dark places. Um, and it has led many people to some very dark places, right? There's a thriving alt-right Heidegger movement out there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it is always like, you know, fascinated that, uh, you know, to see the way that somebody like, you know, the aforementioned Dr. Peterson, who, you know, has, has really been embraced by the whole Anglosphere right wing. He's, you know, working for the Daily Wire now. Mm -hmm. Um will sort of do this thing where uh no you know Karl Marx is permanently discredited by the crimes of Stalinism, but um Heidegger, okay, literally a member of the Nazi party, but like somehow not discredited by that. Uh you know, so the 
It's very confusing standard. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. I, not just you know uh, Heidegger. Carl Jung also had plenty of nice things to say about fascism. So uh, JP is very comfortable uh, being forgiving of people who literally supported Hitler, right? Uh, or at least in Jung's case, had positive things to say about him. Uh, but poor Karl Marx, who lived you know, decades before the Russian Revolution uh, and half a century before Stalinism, you know, no, we can't forgive him for not being able to crystal ball uh, how people might misinterpret his work down the line. Yeah. Uh, so, and I guess, like, I am really interested in this thing, that you're, you know, that how you're describing Heidegger's critique of liberalism and socialism and democracy and the, the sense in which he thinks those are all kind of the same thing. I mean, what it kind of reminds me of is the very end of uh, my debate last year with Curtis Yarvin, where yep. he, he said that uh, Yarvin said that uh, the Soviet Union and the United States were both uh, progressive <laughs> powers. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I and, remember that, yeah. Uh, I was like, ah, that's interesting, right? Uh, I said, well, okay. Um, you know, anybody's confused about what Curtis is saying here. It's like, sure. I mean, if you just fundamentally reject everything that's happened since about the mid 1700s, uh, then, like, I guess I could see how you can get to yourself to the place where the Soviet Union and the United States seem about the same to you because uh, it's all participating in, you know, the modern world. Um, and uh, he he kind of cheerfully embraced that in the uh, in the debate, but it's like a lot of you know Heidegger uh, is sort of the much more extreme version of that, right? It's 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 not like it's not just that it's like everything from the 1770s sometime onward was a mistake, which might be the Curtis Yarvin view. It's that it's like you know everything starting with about Socrates was a mistake. Oh yeah. Uh... We need to go back to the pre-Socratics, right? And this is what makes Heidegger very attractive uh, to conservative revolutionaries, right? Uh, or for that matter, also um, radicals on the right, okay? People who uh, don't want to settle with the status quo and think that we need to transformatively remake society. So I don't want to dive too much into sure. this bigger topic, but you're absolutely, um, I think, onto something when you connect somebody like Yarvin to this. Um, because a lot of people on the far right will write in this way, not just Jarvin, but also people like Avola, uh, Heidegger, Nietzsche, um, or for that matter, Alexander Dugan, right? Um, mm -hmm. So who's a big fan of Heidegger. But if you want to talk a bit about like Heidegger's broader understanding of human history, uh, it has a kind of Nietzschean quality to it. I think, though I think Nietzsche is an infinitely uh, more interesting thinker in this regard, at least, uh, than Heidegger, because Heidegger, again, uh, is very much an idealist uh, when it comes to his philosophy of history. He would hate that I called him that, but that is very much the case. Uh, by the way, not my original idea. That's uh, Habermas and Adorno's point uh, about his philosophy of history. Uh, but, you know, largely speaking, each epoch uh, of the history of being can be understood by looking at its metaphysics, right? Yeah. Uh, and for Heidegger... You can tell whether an epoch is more or less nihilistic by the quality uh, of thinking that emerges amongst philosophers. Of course you can, right? Uh, and so he will often say that, look, in the pre-Socratic period uh, of ancient Greece, uh, when the world was still young, you really did see these big, deep, thoughtful ruminations about the meaning of being from people cool. like Anaximander, Democritus, Parmenides, uh, who's his main fixation, right? Uh, and... This at least shows that they were interested in the question of fundamental ontology. Uh, now, if you read Heidegger a lot, like I did back in the day, you'll sometimes get frustrated because you never will just sit there and, like you said, say, this is what being is. It's always, Parmenides says, this is what being is. Democritus says, this is what being is. And the important thing is to ask the question continuously. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to arrive at an answer. Um, but then what happens with Plato, he thinks, is there's already a bit of a dissent uh, because rather than just being attentive to the question of being and open-minded about it, uh, we start to fill in what being is uh, by saying, you know, being is the existence of eternal forms, for example, right? Uh, and this is a notch down uh, from the kind of open-minded ontological speculation that you saw with the pre-Socratics, because it's an attempt to rigidify uh, these kind of ontological speculations and to say that 
only this rationalistic way of approaching it is appropriate. Uh, and I don't want to get into all the details. There's a transition to Aristotle, a transition to Christian thought that he traces in his book. But then what happens with Descartes, he thinks, uh, is a rad the radicalization uh, of this way of apprehending the world uh, into Cartesian subject-object dualism, which he sees as being at the epicenter of the modern world. Uh, because now you have Descartes not even saying that there are these eternal forms or ideas that exist outside of human beings and which and in which uh, human beings participate. Instead, now all that exists are the ideas in my head and objects external to them, which may or may not exist. Uh, and the goal of human life isn't contemplation. Instead, it's supposed to be this practical activity of transforming the objects in the world into things that are of utility for human beings, right? Uh, and this is where we get into stuff about technology and all that that I don't want to get into. But he sees this as an interesting transition. Uh, and sometimes he thinks it is a great metaphysical moment uh, for the human race because you did have these great modern philosophers who are thinking great thoughts. And of course, they've transformed the world and they brought about the emergence of modern science, uh, modern technology and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, this reduction of the world to what he calls standing reserve uh, in the question of conservative technology uh, constitutes the final withdrawal of being from the epicenter uh, of human self-ruminations, if you want to call it that. Because now we're never thinking about the question of being, even in religious terms. We're just thinking like, oh, this is a whole bunch of different beings in the world. Uh, they don't serve any purpose for themselves uh, except to be used by me in order to produce refrigerators, telephones, uh, satellites, that kind of thing. Yeah. At, at its, like... You know, and I, and I should say, um, you know, the uh, the Edwards book I I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, this uh, you know Heidegger's Confusions is is a very uh, like is a very sharp critique, not for the uh, oh we have to be very know, critical of this. Yeah, not for the uh, you know not for the Nazi stuff, which he barely mentions, you know, but for but just 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 the the metaphysics you know basically and and uh uh also some of the stuff about death and you know he you know edward sort of thinks that heidegger is often sort of making pretty banal comments that are oh, yeah. expressed in the most obscure possible way so they seem like really deep and profound um and um you know but on the on the metaphysics i mean like his his claim is ultimately that uh even though heidegger will say things like you know, yeah, I agree with Kant, you know, existence isn't property. It's like, well, if so, what is it that you're saying about the chalk, pieces of chalk in the classrooms and all that stuff? It certainly sounds like you're treating existence as a property and you're saying it's this like mysterious property that's more fundamental than any other property and that, you know, and that this is, you know, what's that pre-Socratic question that we've lost, right? I mean, like if, if it's not about what that is and, uh, and you know, and, and then like, you know that's the one of the main confusions in the the title right is his critique would be that it's uh that like look i mean he's sort of assuming that it's this profound mystery at the heart of everything but like um i mean just to put it crassly it's like i don't know maybe he should have read bertrand russell and like uh yeah you know decided that you know and like said well maybe existence you know, we shouldn't be thinking about it that way, right? Maybe when we're saying that, like, the piece of chalk in the classroom or whatever exists, what we're really, you know, what it really, you know, that's, like, exists is just kind of like a, a logical constant, like, like, and or, or not, you know, and that, like, you know, you're saying, like, what you're really saying when you say the piece of chalk exists is that, like, the description being a piece of chalk matches something. That's the, that's the, that's the critique. Now, I should say I'm not entirely sure what I make of that critique, uh, one of the reasons I'm not entirely sure what I make of that critique is that I would have to be more sure of what Heidegger was saying about this <laughs> yeah. uh, to uh, to be confident about whether Edwards like has him on this. I uh, I, I, I did go back. I, I I did get curious enough to go into JSTOR and read a bunch of the uh, papers that people wrote about you know in response to Edwards at the at the time. And you know I'm not sure any of them quite got it kind of the nub of what he's raising although i'll also say that um you know i i think that there's a 
because Heidegger often seems to be saying things that are so interesting and because it's so tricky to figure out exactly what some of it means, I, I, I think that like people who've really devoted to themselves to this oftentimes end up getting incredibly defensive. Uh, you know, like if you if you sort of make basic criticisms of of what he says, like, oh no, you just you just don't get it. Right. Like, like, like you just, you just haven't read deeply enough into this or thought about it enough to, you know, completely comprehend the master's insights. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, my friend Ronald Beener put it really well uh, in his book, Dangerous Minds, uh, Nietzsche Heidegger uh, and the rise of the far right. Uh, Any book uh, that writes about the emergence of a new ruling elite of overmen uh, or how only a certain cadre of individuals in society are genuinely authentic or peoples are authentic and everyone else isn't, uh, is almost inviting their readers to think of themselves as part of that elite, right? Uh, that's kind of the appeal, right? Especially if you're alienated and angry, uh, but you don't want to turn to the left, you can pick this up and think, oh, he's right, you know? Uh, I'm surrounded by a mass of mediocrities uh, who are just engaged in idle chatter and who don't want to think deep thoughts about being like me. Uh, now, I think there are a number of different ways that we can criticize this politically. Uh, one of the most obvious that I like to point out is just what you mentioned about Russell, right? Which is that the curious thing is that if he was aware of what was going on in disciplines outside of philosophy in uh-huh. the early 20th century, he'd probably know that there were really deep and interesting questions about ontology that were going on in analytical logic, uh, physics, right? Uh, yeah. You know, think about the Einstein Bohr debate, uh, religion, you name it, right? Uh, if anything, uh, liberal and in particular uh, social democratic societies seem to actually prompt people to engage in the kind of big picture, qu- picture questioning uh, that he says almost no one is doing uh, in modern liberal and social democratic societies. Right now, not all of this is really high quality speculation. I mean, sure. I know way too many fucking new age people who told me the answer to life is just to smoke a joint uh, and let my Zen lines take me out there. And maybe it is right. But I don't know that I'm uh, quite convinced or sure. sold yet. Uh, But, you know, there is a lot of this kind of speculation that's going on. Uh, But I think the more basic critique that we have to make uh, as historical materialists, at the very least, uh, is that any attempt to read the history of the West, so-called, or Europe uh, or modernity through the lens of goddamn philosophy, right, uh, is bound to not only miss a lot, but to distort an awful lot. Uh, Now, I think there's interesting things if you read his history of being that you can pick up on. Uh, here and there. Uh, but, you know, it's missing things like actual history, war, the development uh, and the concrete application of a lot of those technologies that he's talking about. There's nothing about political economy uh, in his work at all, because why would there be? You know, that's a crass, non-philosophical discipline uh, that is irrevocably associated uh, with liberal and socialist humanism. Right? Uh, there's nothing all that interesting he has to say about modern science, uh, except in these very general ways. Uh, all of this is stuff that gets kind of shunted aside uh, to myopically focus on this very philosophical history of being. And I just don't find it all that interesting, uh, if I'm being honest with you. If you wanted to know more about the history of, say, the 20th century uh, or yeah. modernity, I'd recommend don't read Heidegger. Uh, you know, Read Hobsbawm, right? Hobsbawm will teach you an awful lot more about all of these things. Uh, and it'll be a lot more straightforward and you'll probably have a few laughs in there that you'll never get with Heidegger, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I keep thinking about, so there was a comment in the chat a while ago from, from Matt Riss uh, who who said, you know- Oh, Matt Heidegger. Riss is, uh, yeah, Matt Riss is great, yeah. Yeah, big fan. Uh, he said uh, Heidegger thought that, uh, what were the three categories I mentioned? Uh, peasants, uh, toddlers, and, so, and soldiers- uh, were closer to this sort of primordial awareness of being than the the rest of us, um, which you know I I think is maybe an interesting way to to frame this because like yeah I mean if you think about this kind of fundamental rejection of cosmopolitanism enlightenment rationalism like the uh, idea you know like I mean there is some sense in which what I see Heidegger, as you're saying, or uh, these more recent, you know, contemporary figures like, uh, you know, Alexander Dugan or, you know, our own uh, stunted homegrown version, uh, Curtis Yarvin, uh, like saying that, oh, um, like, 
you know, Marxism, socialism, and like the sort of liberal democratic variant of capitalism, you know, all have something fundamentally in common. That it's like, it's not like I don't see their point. It's like, yeah, there, oh, yeah. there, there is in fact stuff that's in common there. It, I mean, it's it's that, yeah, I mean, everybody who's sort of operated within the parameters of the modern world in a certain way has accepted some basic ideas about human equality and how, you know, we should be trying to sort of think hard about how to use our, you know, exploit our knowledge of the world to make life better for us because, you know, we're not just, uh, you know, like people actually, you know, matter in themselves, you know, that they're, 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 we're not just sort of vessels for, you know, God's plan or the greatness of the nation that you're part of or whatever, that like you have a, you have a certain dignity in yourself as a person. And, like this is a, you know, whether or not somebody's politics and practice actually like fulfill this, these premises in any interesting way, anybody who's sort of basically operating within the conceptual syntax of the modern world is at least going to pay lip service to some of this stuff. And so it's like, yeah, that that is a commonality. That is a sense in which, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union or, you know, aggressive powers or whatever in the 20th century. And it's like, but so it's like, but the more I see their point about this stuff, the more I just think it's like, yeah, all, my only reaction to that is, yes, modernity is really good. Oh, absolutely. Right. But I think it's important to explain the appeal in terms of rejection of modernity that way. Right. So. Heidegger, Nietzsche, Evola, Dugan, and Yarvin offer people on the political right something that generic conservatives don't really offer, uh, which is a way of being radical, right, uh, and rejecting the world that you are part of, not defending the status quo and not even defending the traditions you are brought up in without embracing uh, the egalitarian radicalism of the modern world. Uh, and this is where you see uh, a lot of far-right movements emerging from, right, because what you find with Heidegger is somebody who sits there and says, conservatism isn't enough, right? Because uh, what are we trying to conserve if all that we have is this modern, nihilistic, social democratic Weimar Republic, right? Uh, that needs to go, right? Uh, and that can be very exciting, at least for the people who are elite and enlightened enough uh, to get to participate in it. Uh, but what distinguishes uh right-wing radicalism uh, from left-wing radicalism is that left-wing radicalism will usually talk about how everyone is going to be included in the kind of radical changes that we make and is going to benefit from it in the long run uh, and should participate in it as an equal. The difference is that radicals on the right uh, will adopt the view of ordinary people that Heidegger talks about or adopts in Introduction to Metaphysics, where he talks about how democracy is a terrible thing because it is ruled by mediocrities, right? Uh, and we've seen the rule of the mediocre or mediocre spread across the entire world, right? Uh, or Dugan, right? Uh, in his book on Heidegger, captured a nice Heideggerian spirit very well, uh, where he talks about how the philosopher marches uh, up mountains uh, and thinks nothing uh, of the kind of insect-like people below him, uh, except what kind of destiny will I give to these people? Which, which I suppose is, that's which is a lot. Point. I suppose makes it a lot easier to. Uh... Uh, support uh, drafting a fuck lot of them and sending them off to uh, to to uh, die in a long war for uh, to decide exactly where the border between Russia and Ukraine will be in the Donbass. Well, that's exactly it, and uh, this is something that I point out in the book that you're uh, pitching there. So thank you. Uh, the amusing thing about almost all of these far right figures, uh, with their veneration of violence, power, authority, and hierarchy, uh, as they start off by preening uh, as radicals committed to inauthenticity, wound up embracing the most inauthentic kind of politics you can possibly imagine, uh, and then almost inevitably find themselves uh, endorsing the most banal and cruel uh, kind of policies. Uh, first is tragedy, and then is farce. Uh, you have the Nazi regime defined by this banality of evil, uh, where millions were liquidated uh, for the most horrific kind of reasons you can imagine by thoughtless people in many circumstances. Uh, and now you have its more farcical replacement uh, with Dugan, uh, where he's willing to send millions of 50-year-old Russians uh, to go die for his greater, grander Eurasian empire. Uh, it's really quite funny, uh, the kind of things that these people wind up imagining to be important. Uh, and this is why 
we have to understand the appeal of right-wing radicalism and its appeal to a certain kind of chauvinistic or aristocratic or elitist outsider uh, while combating it uh, in every kind of form that it takes. Yeah. Uh, so the book uh, is uh, The Political Right and Equality, Turning Back the Tide of Egalitarian Modernity. Uh, we will put a, uh, a link to that uh, in the uh, show notes. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, go in just a minute uh, to uh, the post game uh, for uh, for patrons. Uh, you know, we've got the you know, I mean, just to go from the sort of uh, you know grotesque and fascinated uh, philosophical yeah. heights of Heidegger to uh, uh, I, I don't. I don't know if we're going with Ron Dissect, Demodius, or Meatball Ron. Uh, I mean, why be selective, right? We can fucking roll out with either of them. Meatball Ron is a lot of fun. Ron Dissect, Demodius, though, kind of has the appeal of being the most true way of describing him. Like, having read his book, <laughs> I did sit there and think to myself, like, oh, that's my Ron Dissect, Demodius, at least a few fucking times. So, yeah, I, a lot own, of, but that's why a lot of people say that like trump was off his game with that one but i i, I actually kind of like uh rod de sanctimonious it's a slow burning uh, one but uh before before we do that um uh, you know we've been talking about um uh, you know we've been talking kind of this whole episode one way or another about anti-egalitarian politics uh about various views of the world according to which uh it's, um, you know, greatness or authenticity or whatever is, is best served by, um, you know, not caring at all about those, those people, you know, like insects blow you, except for insofar as they can serve destiny, uh, like the, the Dugan quote you just, uh, you just brought up. Uh, so I would like to actually end the note, end the main show on a positive note and, uh, and with a little bit of a palate cleanser from, uh, from all of that. So uh, going uh, from, um, you know, going from uh, the, uh, the sort of trip through uh, the darkest parts of the history of the 20th uh, century to uh, something that happened uh, last week. Uh, so from Monday through Friday uh, Hi, last, we last week, uh, I, was, uh, I was on strike uh, at, uh, at Rutgers. So this is, you know, as part of the odd patchwork of income streams of you know stitched together to let me spend most of my time writing and podcasting i'm still teaching a couple of online classes as an adjunct at Rutgers, and uh all all three actually the faculty unions at, at Rutgers, including the uh including the, the one represented adjuncts uh were on strike uh this uh this last week um i should uh uh, so I uh, spent a lot of this week uh, talking about that one way or another. Uh, I had uh, wrote about it for uh, for Jacobin. I wrote an article called uh, "I'm on Strike at Rutgers to Fight the Uberification of Higher Education." Uh, I was on a couple of talk radio uh, shows, uh, one in New York and one in LA, the last week. Uh, the Tavis Smiley. Uh, at uh, uh, in uh, in Los Angeles and uh, Frank Morato uh, in New York. And in both cases, I was invited on to talk about different things. But I asked if I could talk about the Rutgers strike for a few minutes. And both of those uh, also went on uh, the Young Turks. Talked to Anna Kasparian about the strike, and then on um, Thursday, actually uh, made a little pilgrimage to New Jersey so I could. Uh, I could do my duty on the uh, the picket lines on uh, Friday, which it turns out was actually just in the nick of time, because uh, uh, the uh, I I did uh, spent Friday on the picket line, and then uh, late Friday night uh, the strike ended uh, with uh, exactly uh, the strike ended uh, with uh, massive concessions uh, by Rutgers management. Uh, included oh, yeah. a forty eight percent pay increase phased in over the next few semesters for uh, for adjuncts um, and uh, a lot more job security for uh, not I saw that. that's fucking nuts guys yeah 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 uh, 
I, uh, I should say, as uh, far as uh, philosophers whose politics I like a lot more than I, uh, I like Martin Heidegger's, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I made a little, I did pop my, uh, my head in. I, I used to uh, teach in person at Rutgers for years and years, actually. I was on the like, board of the adjunct union for a couple of years, and you know, that used to be like my only job. So I uh, still know a fair amount of people there. I, I popped my head in the philosophy department on, uh, on Friday before I went over to uh, the picket line. I uh, was very happy to see that it was uh, all decorated like this. That's the main bulletin board. You can see <laughs> yeah. philosophy department strike HQ uh, and uh, this one that is uh, there are a bunch of sort of cutesy philosophy themed uh, numbers of days. Like one of the, you know, one of them is number of days since this board has been erased. I guess that always has to be zero. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, number of days last causally efficacious absence. The one with the big long number is the number of days. I believe that's since the Big Bang. And then there's the number of days <laughs> without a contract, which at that point was 287. Uh, and, uh, and then the number of days on strike that at that point was uh, was four. Um, and uh, so just to, you know, whatever. It's honestly... It's a small thing, but it's not that small a thing because this is like the uh, relative to the size of New Jersey, at least Rutgers is a massive state yeah. university system. And I, I do think that given these kind of trends of, uh, inc- you know, what I was calling in the Jacobin article, the uberification of higher education, the increase in reliance on contingent uh, faculty and all that, I, I, I do think the, the eyes of... Uh, university labor organizers around the country who were very much trained on what was going on at Rutgers this week. So I, I, I think, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders. Yeah, we, we celebrated here. Uh, I saw the geos were all fucking happy about that. And yeah, Bernie Sanders gave you a shout out. Yeah. Bernie Sanders was actually tweeting a lot about the Rutgers strike this last week. It's kind of, it was kind of surreal to see. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I thought to, uh, to close out the episode on a positive note, uh, Jake uh, took, uh, so I was on the picket line on Friday. I took some uh, some like short cell phone videos, uh, and then we also I think have some clips from some of those appearances that I mentioned talking about it. So we have a little uh, two and a half minute uh, Rutgers <laughs> strike montage. It's just to uh, just to to end the uh, end the episode on a high note. Dare to call it a documentary. I want to hear I want to hear a lot of uh, praise and. Uh... Letterbox, good letterbox reviews for this too. Yeah, half. so so we're gonna be. Uh, I I think we're just gonna close out on this, and then uh, please do hit like and subscribe if you have not done that. I don't say that enough. Uh, the uh, uh, but if you are not a patron, um, patreon.com slash Ben Burgess, you can become give them an argument patron uh, for. Uh, five bucks a month. Uh, get uh, get the patron exclusive post games after every regular Monday night episode. Discord server, lots of other stuff. Uh, but um, right now, you will get to see Matt McManus uh, talking about Ron Sanctimonious. We've also got some tremendous stuff about Cat Turd. So um, yeah. you know, should be uh, should be fun. But right now. I'm just going to say the thing right now because we're going to close out of the documentary. So we'll see people in just a minute of the post game. Left is best. Left is best. You are a lecturer at Rutgers, but as I understand it, you're on strike now. Why are you on strike? Rutgers, like many universities, as there are trends across higher education in uh, the United States increasingly wants to rely on a workforce that's much more precarious, has many fewer job protections. They try to keep people every year just below the threshold of the number of classes they have to, they wear. if they assign them that many classes, they'd have to reclassify them as full time, pay them much more money, give them health insurance. And I think this goes along with a lot of other trends elsewhere in American society. And one of the big demands is equal pay for equal work. In other words, if you are teaching as an adjunct, which an increasingly large percentage of the people teaching undergraduates at Rutgers are, increasingly large percentage of faculty all around the country teaching undergraduates are, people who are working part-time, you should be paid proportionately to the salary of a full-time person with a peer teaching job. Uh, 
oftentimes when people think about professionals, what we really mean is people who like need advanced degrees to uh, to have a job, or there's some kind of like social prestige associated with the job. But uh, the problem is that you can't really uh, eat social prestige or use it to pay the bill, uh, the copay, if you need to uh, to go see a doctor. And oftentimes, especially as higher education gets uberized, in other words, with an increasingly large section of the workforce that's actually teaching undergraduate classes, increasingly resemble the labor conditions not of traditional cab drivers with benefits and pensions, but Uber drivers who have to worry about getting kicked off of the app at any time. Uh, increasingly, people who are acculturated to think of them themselves this way that they, you know, oh, I'm not like a worker, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm a professional, I'm, I'm somebody who's like navigating the world in this different way. Actually, no, what they really need is the same kind of collective struggle for a better deal that everybody does. Hopefully, you'll come on soon to tell us that you guys succeeded in getting what you wanted through the strike. Uh, but thank you for taking the time to come on, Ben.